Down here I have three culture samples of a wild yellow poured chicken of the woods mushroom that I cloned onto agar while well, I attempted to clone onto agar. These are only uh, three of like 15 samples that I took from that nice little fruit body that I found growing on a dead, I think it was an elm tree. I found it on my way to work. I did not have time to try to take a video of it or anything like that. So unfortunately, this is the only thing that I have to show of that chicken of the woods mushroom. But that's, it's, this isn't really a video about specific chicken of the woods. This is a video about contaminated petri dish cultures from either wild mushroom cloning samples, agar transfers, spore inoculation, anything that has to relate to culture samples on agar and dealing with contamination. That's what this video is about. You've probably noticed that up here this Petri dish does not say, see how these ones say yellow cow, <laughs> yellow chicken of the woods, yellow pork chicken of the woods. This one up here says parasol. The reason why I have a completely different mushroom up here on one sole lonely Petri dish is because I inoculated this at the same time that I inoculated these. And this right here is a sample. You can see it growing pretty nicely there in the middle. It's kind of fogged up on the, the lid, but you can still see that under there. It's growing really nicely on the agar in here and there's absolutely no contaminations. The reason why I have a different species of mushroom growing up here is to kind of act as a control because the sample taken from these three right here were all taken from the same wild mushroom fruit body and then cut out and placed onto agar, whereas this one right here was inoculated the same day as these ones, well, pretty much like within minutes of these ones, but this sample was taken from a completely colonized 60 millimeter Petri dish of parasol mushroom. And I wanted to inoculate just a separate type of mushroom alongside these guys to make sure that the setup that I was using out here and like the air quality and the tools that I was using and my my uh, sanitation practices, you know, making sure my hands were clean, da 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 da, making sure that that was not the cause of any contamination issues I might run into. Seeing as this one's an absolutely perfect culture transfer with no satellite colonies and no contaminations, I think it's safe to say that the only variable that we have to worry about in this set up here is the mushroom tissue cultures themselves. That being said, I do have from those 15 chicken mushroom clones that I have on agar, I do have some that are perfectly fine that have absolutely no contaminations, which is fantastic. But I also have a few, as you can see here, that did get contaminated. I wanted to show you that it's going to happen. Like, it's annoying as it is, this is going to be a fairly common occurrence and this is something that you're going to have to deal with. Even if you do everything properly, even if you take all the proper precautions, even if you, you know, like I, like I said in my video about cloning a white button mushroom, how you break the fruit body in half instead of cutting it and you take a scoop of the tissue culture from the middle of the fruit body and put it onto agar. Chances are whenever you're dealing with a wild mushroom that has like an unknown life style that it led, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, there's a whole lot of variables out in nature that you just can't really take into consideration until you are forced to deal with that variable. And one thing that happens very frequently with wild mushrooms is even though the fruit body itself may look perfect, to the unaided eye, it's very possible that that mushroom, even if it wasn't colonized by certain insect species or whatever, it's possible that at one point during its growth cycle, an insect or something bore through the point where you were taking the tissue sample from, and while it was boring through that mushroom, it dragged in bacteria or yeast or mold spores or whatever, any kind of microorganism that the mushroom could then just kind of close itself around and encapsulate but not completely kill off. So it's very, very common for even the insides of wild mushrooms to contain contaminations and that's something you're just going to have to deal with. So let's use one of these as an example. I kind of want to get one. Yeah, let's let's go with this one right here just because it like I don't mind taking the lid off of this one because if I have to lose this petri dish, it's not the end of the world. We're going to use this one as an example to look at this underneath the microscope and we're going to use this one, as, this one as an example to talk about with the lid off. That way you can see it easier. Well, let's just get into it. So let me take the lid off here. You can see this part right here is the actual piece of tissue that was extracted from the middle of the chicken of the woods shelf and then that was just cut out under sterile conditions and placed onto the 
this agar 60 millimeter petri dish you can kind of see how this part right here is starting to put off some new mycelial growth that's actually the the mushroom well this piece of tissue trying to grow outwards into the petri dish and put off extra mycelium and then trying to recolonize this petri dish from that tissue sample but unfortunately i guess we'll address the elephant in the room or the elephant in the petri dish here there's also these areas right here of severe contamination seeing as how everything else around the petri dish is completely devoid of anything there's no bacterial growth there's no mycelial growth from molds there's no yeast colonies or anything that leads us to believe that this mushroom tissue sample itself was contaminated with whatever this is that's growing on here so let me go put this underneath my little microscope here and we'll talk about this a little bit more so that you can see a little bit better and then i'll show you how to salvage like over here is a, a sample that's contaminated over here but it's it's not quite as bad so i'll show you how to salvage something like this for possibly being able to isolate the tissue sample and the mushroom culture from that contamination. Okay, I have the Petri dish underneath my little microscope here with the LCD screen on. Now you can see things a lot easier. Now I can actually point to things without damaging the, the colony. I actually, while I was moving this over to the microscope, I, I kind of, I went to put the cap on, like the, the, the lid for the Petri dish on, and I bumped this piece right here, so it kind of smooshed it over to the side a little bit. But everything's still very visible and, and easily discernible, so it's not really that big of a deal. Right here, this part here is the part of the chicken of the woods tissue that we put on the petri dish like you gotta imagine that all the stuff around here in a big circle like here this is the petri dish right so this whole thing is agar and this is laying right pretty much in the middle of the agar right so chicken of the woods and you can see it's starting to put off this is what mushroom mycelium looks like whenever it's like growing from a cloned piece of fungal tissue it starts putting out these little thin wisps of mycelium because Remember, the fruit body that we're eating is just a concentrated mass of the mycelium from the main colony. So once this is isolated and put into an environment that will allow it to continue to grow, it will start to grow just like it was growing from spore, basically. It will just put off little filaments of mycelial growth and try to colonize whatever it, that it is placed on top of. And don't pay attention to the date stamp on here. I never bother to set that because every time I unplug it, it resets it and I don't care. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you can see that it's trying to put off some growth. And we, we do have some here radiating outward from the tissue sample onto the actual Petri dish. So it was starting to colonize. But unfortunately, you can see a chunk. This must have been a little piece of the tissue broke off. Same with right here. This must have broke off while I was transferring it from the scalpel blade onto the agar itself. And you can see that these pieces here are just completely, completely taken over by these rather neat looking bacterial colonies. I'm fairly sure that they're, what are they called, lobate or something of that matter, irregular uh, bacterial colonies. We're not all that worried about the type of bacteria that we're dealing with. All we're worried about is the fact that we are dealing with the contamination. What this suggests to us that despite the contaminations, we did at the very least provide a decent environment for this to grow if it wasn't contaminated because it is trying to colonize this petri dish i don't even think we're going to bother trying to salvage this one just because it's so heavily contaminated like if if you have this level of, of contamination unless it's your only dish that you have any type of growth I recommend just kind of discarding this one. We're, that's why we're using this one as an as an example. But since we do have, like I said, if this is the only thing that you have or if you want to challenge, you see this part right here where we have this nice wispy growth of mushroom mycelium up here in this section. We could take a chunk of like a really small sample from this part right here and we could transfer that onto another agar petri dish even professional labs sometimes they have to do two three four five six a dozen different transfers in order to isolate a monoculture from a fungal sample so if you're doing this at home like i am don't be discouraged if you have to do a couple of different transfers in order to get a sterile culture okay but like i was saying if you absolutely needed to and this one right here we could take a chunk of this agar petri dish right there from this spot and then we could just simply transfer that onto another sterile petri dish and 
as long as that itself doesn't carry any contaminations over with it, we could let it grow out, and then that could be our colonized petri dish for this particular example of chicken mushroom. Say you start with a petri dish of this size, and let's say that we take our chunk, put it here where this guy is, and it starts radiating outwards, say, in an area like that. But over on this side, say we get a little bit of this, just like all it takes is one or two of these guys to hitch a ride, and we get one of these growths over on this side. That sucks, but at the same time, that's actually not the end of the world because then that means we have a really nice large sample that we could take a nice big chunk of the mushroom mycelium from a, a spot that would be over here all by itself, and then we could transfer that onto another Petri dish, and usually that should give you a pretty good clean sample as long as uh, you are careful about your air quality and your, your sterility procedures and all that stuff. So now I have the camera set up, that's good. This first one that I'm going to do, I'm only going to really worry about showing the proper way to do it. So I'm not too concerned about contaminations because I'm more going to use this one as an example of how to properly isolate a potentially successful culture sample from a contaminated Petri dish. I'm going to do this completely out in the open. I'll still like make sure that my hands are sanitized and all that stuff. I'm going to be using a, a sterile scalpel blade. I'm going to use a brand new scalpel blade. This was sprayed down with alcohol. For this demonstration right here, I'm just going to very deliberately show you what I'm doing. So like I said, if I lose this one too, it's not that big of a deal. But for the other sample right here, for the other Petri dish, I am going to probably not even really talk. I'll probably just do this one as quickly as I can so that I can just make sure that I get a good sample onto these other Petri dishes. I'm not really gonna go a whole lot into detail about how I do this because I've already done a video on how I do like clones and tissue transfers and all that stuff. This is more about the practical application of isolating a mushroom culture from a contaminated Petri dish. You can see Right here on this side, this is actually a fairly clean side of the mushroom culture itself. So over here we have all these contaminations. This right here is a perfect spot to try to do transfer from because there's no contaminations on this side. So if you have growth like this, best thing to do in this case is cut a little chunk from the agar. Try to, if you can, try to only get the agar like this see that wasn't ideal but it'll get the point across and then we want to just do that that's really all you have to do i don't think it's really going to come through on camera there is some mycelium on there let's just use this petri dish as an example so i'm not going to really worry about this guy growing and i just touched the freaking agar <laughs> i did i forgot that the lid was off of this i'm not used to that but anyway i'll show you another uh transfer let's pretend that the only good part of this mushroom culture like say that Every other thing that you did failed, or let's say that this part right here is the only piece. This part right here is the only piece that didn't get contaminated yet. And we're also going to pretend that this scalpel is perfectly sterile, like we didn't just make that cut right there. But you get the idea. So what we're going to do is take a very tiny, very tiny sample from that clean area. In this case, the smaller the area, the better. And obviously you want to be doing this as quickly as you can, but I'm just kind of, since I'm using this for a demonstration, I'm just kind of walking you through the procedure, walking you through the steps. But we want to take a very, very small sample of clean culture and then put that onto another sterile Petri dish, right? And then, you know, close it up and put it in the incubator or whatever you want to do. But by taking a very, very tiny sample, we're just kind of trying to use geometry to our advantage here. The less surface area that you're working with if you're taking a mushroom sample, the less chance of contamination you have just because there's simply less of the culture there to worry about having microbes on it, right? Once again, we're just gonna ignore all this stuff. We'll do one more faux transfer, <laughs> faux transfer. Let's say that this part right here is the only one that we, like the only area that we had good growth on that's not contaminated. So if you really wanted to, you could just do this. Almost just scoop. 
scoop that good piece out of there. And be sure, like, while you're scooping, not to accidentally drop it. I've done this before. Don't drop it in the contamination, for one. But two, don't, like, accidentally, like, graze the contamination or anything like that. Okay? And then pretend that this is a, a completely empty, sterile Petri dish that has nothing on it. Just ignore those two chunks in there. And then, like I said, you're doing this as fast as possible, usually. So once you get your small sample that looks clean, put it on here and close it. Let me close this up so I don't poke it again. The first few days while I am incubating my Petri dishes, I like to let them stay unwrapped. So I'll put them in my incubator just like this for a few days. See how this one has all this uh, condensation on the top, which isn't really that big of a deal. But like, if possible, I like to give these a few days unwrapped to try and give these the chance to maybe evaporate off some of that excess water that may be present in the Petri dish themselves. That way, whenever these are growing, it doesn't condense on the top like this one did and then maybe rain down on the Petri dish while it's growing. And also, by letting it grow for a few days in the incubator unwrapped, that also gives it a chance to start colonizing the, the agar and then that'll kind of anchor that little sample down onto the agar and then you can wrap these after a few days and then invert them that way if it does condense the top is now the bottom and then that way all of the condensation will be on the bottom of the petri dish not rain down onto the top of the agar itself usually you're fine by just inverting these straight from the cloning process like this but once in a while you'll run into the issue where the sample that you put onto the agar while it's like freshly on there and if it's inverted sometimes it'll just kind of dislocate lodge itself from the surface of the agar and fall off and then that's just kind of completely negating any work that you just did so yeah that's why i like to let these grow for a few days before i wrap them and then i invert them but yeah let's let's move these off to the side i can move my parasol one off to the side too i'm going to take this off now i'm going to put a new blade on here a new sterile blade first before i do let me do this like, I'm just going to do the procedure the way I normally would do it. So let me get another blade. This is the one that we're going to actually try and salvage. So I'm not going to really talk about this while I'm doing it. I'm just going to do it. All right, here we go. sterilize well, let me flame sterilize my scalpel blade let that cool down for a second while it's cooling down since I touched that I'm going to spray my hands down with some more alcohol if you're not sure whether or not your scalpel is cool enough. See how there's nothing over here on this part of the agar, how it's completely like devoid of any colonies of bacteria or anything. You can just plunge your knife blade into that to make sure it's cool enough, and then you can take your sample. Next sample, now. Okay, that, that off to the side there. And now, move these guys here. Now all I gotta do is label them. And this is another reason why I like to use QR codes for my final labeling system, not com cow because my handwriting is not that great. <laughs> I 
Now it's just a matter of, like I said, put these in the incubator or wherever you're going to use to let them colonize. If you don't have an incubator, that's fine, but I do highly recommend at least putting them in like a, like maybe a Tupperware container that's vented so that there's not a whole lot of air movement around because even though these are covered, you know, they're covered by design. If you have a fan on or something, or even if somebody walks by these fast enough to have a decent amount of air movement, it can still get up underneath these lids just enough to contaminate the edges. Let me tell you a little story real quick. <laughs> Whenever I built my first incubator, I built it out of a wooden box with a reptile heat lamp that was on a temperature controlled sensor, you know, so I could set the temperature and all that stuff. And it actually worked really, really well. The problem is me and my infinite wisdom at the time thought it was a great idea to have a small computer fan in my incubator, my thought process was, well, I'll just have a small fan in there to keep the air, you know, at a consistent temperature. That way there's no hot or cold spots in my incubator, which was fine for like mushroom bags and for like wrapped Petri dishes. But I had a lot of unwrapped Petri dishes in there and every single one of them kept getting contaminated and I could not figure out why. And it was always, always like the contamination, you could tell, started from the very edge and was working its way inwards. And I just could not, for the life of me, figure out for the longest time why my Petri dishes kept getting contaminated that way. And it took me longer than it probably should have to realize it was because of the freaking fan that I had in there that was creating air currents that could get up just enough underneath the lid and just deposit one or two little spores onto the edge of the agar and then they just worked their way in. So it doesn't take much. <laughs> but yeah, just put these in an area where the air is going to be as still as possible. The thing I like about my new lab incubator that I purposely bought for incubating Petri dishes is that I don't have to worry about fans and stuff because it's a gravity incubator purpose built for incubating Petri dishes. But yeah, we're going to let this colonize for about three days before wrapping them. And then I will put them back in upside down to continue colonizing. And even if you get to this point and say like a few days later or like have like a week later or so, you start getting some pretty decent growth. But if even if your transfers have slight contamination, just just repeat exactly what I did here. And typically you can get a pretty clean sample with one or two transfers. Sometimes it does take a few transfers. So don't feel too bad if you transfer one tissue sample onto a clean Petri dish, hoping to uh, be devoid of any contaminations, yet you still end up with a contamination. Sometimes it does take a few transfers. So that's really all there is to it. I'm gonna put these off to the side and I have a few more that I'll probably do just before, since I have everything set up out here, I have a few more that I'll, I'll get out of the way and just do that before I go inside. But yeah, that's how you salvage, or at least attempt to salvage, a contaminated mushroom culture. So we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.